what you're seeing happen up here right now with the butterfly is what we want to talk about this morning about what happens when we as individuals become the body of Christ part of the body of Christ the church so I want to talk to you this morning from Romans 12 and you'll understand why in just a minute uh, call this transformed living this morning I'm not going to make any attempt to tell a joke or to be funny in any way or to give you some deep theological message Rather, uh, this message is designed to speak to the moment that we're in right now. Um, the last several weeks, to say the least, have been really tough on some of us. Last month, uh, a man that I admired, that I went to high school with, that I played football with, that was one of the first employees that I hired when I started Island Christian School and came on board here at Island Community Church back in 1974. I can't describe the admiration I had for this man, Carl Pierce. Um, Passed away, lost a battle of cancer. And um, as I thought about this, I thought, you know, Carl and I spent more years together than almost anyone, more than family. Because when you spend 30 years of your life with someone, that's a lot of years, that's a lot of time. And uh, his home going, at first, didn't hit me so hard because he had moved away. But then as time had passed, it was like losing a brother. And we're going to do a funeral service here for a celebration of life, a memorial on the 20th at 2 o'clock here at Island Community. So if you knew Carl, and certainly I know his family would love to, to have you here celebrating with him. Um, then a few days ago, my real brother, Dean, was found unresponsive in the lobby of a hotel where he was staying doing an art project in Kansas and his co-worker found him had no idea how long he'd been out he gets up very early comes down gets you know gets a breakfast gets coffee and so on so there was nobody in the lobby except him his co-worker found him on the floor and started CPR the paramedics got there asked the co-worker where he'd learned how to do CPR, he said Chicago Med <laughs> or Chicago PD or one of them, which I thought was a little bit funny. But then um, they took him to the hospital. They did not expect him to make it. I was trying to figure out how to get to Oklahoma. Then I realized he was working in Kansas, not Oklahoma. So we didn't even know where he was at that point. Uh, he was in ICU. They put him in an induced coma. He was there for a couple of days. And believe it or not, he's fully recovered. He had some stents put in and his is, is doing okay. Um, he's rehabbing. I've talked to him a few times. On Friday of last week, I got a call from Fort Myers letting me know that Diane Keith, as some of you would know her, Diane Kubiak, um, the last of the fishing legends of the Keith family here in Isla Mirada. for those of you that have been around the fishing community would, would know the Keiths, um, had just had a stroke and was not expected to live. And one of Diane's last requests before she completely went out was that I would come over and be there with her family. So I jumped in the car and drove over to Fort Myers. And I was there. She passed actually on the way as I was driving over. But I was there with her. Um, Then on Saturday, I received a message from Bill Neely Jr who was the director of Mission to Haiti, that his dad, Bill Neely Sr., who had founded Mission to Haiti, uh, had had some surgery, or we all thought he was doing fine, that he had passed away. He was the director, founder of Mission to Haiti. We support Mission to Haiti. I'm on the board of directors for Mission to Haiti. So that was what hit number four, I guess. But then the big one, that's made me call for this message this morning is on Monday I received a text from Pastor Trevor letting me know that it looked like his mom was about to step into heaven and she passed on Tuesday so Donna DeLacy as we originally knew her back in school Donna Mann as many of us knew throughout the bulk of her life And then finally, Donna Mayfield, who worked here at Island Christian School, Island Community Church for a number of years, by the way, and was the one who 
initiated the conversation that led to Pastor Trevor now being our lead pastor here at a Community Church. She's the one that generated the conversation about me going and asking Trevor if he would like to have a job if he ever left the other job that he was in. So that's how that all came about. So to say the least, <clears throat> this has been a heavy few weeks. And it's been a particularly heavy time right now on, on Trevor and his family. So um, what I'm going to do is just going to ask us to bow together. We're going to have a word of prayer. And then I'm going to do some teaching for us this morning. So let's just bow together as the church, as the body of Christ, and pull alongside of, uh, of Trevor and his family. Father, you have given us clear instruction here to rejoice with those who rejoice and to mourn with those who mourn. So today we have that opportunity to be the church. It's easy for us to laugh and get excited with each other and to celebrate victories. But sometimes it's awkward and difficult to weep with someone, to pull alongside them. So Lord, I pray that you'll be with Trevor, Nikki, Isla, Lacey, the extended family. We know that uh, they knew this was coming, but that doesn't ease the pain. So we just pray that during this time today, that they'll find your grace and mercy. You say it passes all understanding, so we ask for it today. And pray for this body, the body of Christ, as we have individuals who suffer loss that we don't even know about at times. We pray that we, as the body of Christ, will be able to pull alongside each other and love each other and care for each other as you've called us to. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, <clears throat> how do you dignify a message, uh, or bring a message, rather, that dignifies all of this, all that we're going through? And I began to think about it. I, the Holy Spirit just kept taking me back to Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12. It's, it's, it's one of my favorite passages in all the Scripture. And so I thought, well, I'm just going to talk through it today and teach through it. Give you some things that hopefully will help you, not only in this situation, but in situations to come. Because, newsflash, we will all go through this from those that we love. Um, and certainly as you get to a certain age, it, begins to, it seems like the pace begins to increase significantly of the people around you. And uh, so we need some things to help us know how to get through all of this. So let's jump into Romans chapter 12. If you have a Bible, you can look at it. I'll put the verses up on the screen. Um, but let's jump into verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters. So obviously, he's talking to the church, the body of Christ. In view of God's mercy, mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. How do you offer? worship him by offering yourself as a living sacrifice. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed. Metamorphosis. It's, it's the idea as you just saw. It is that exact where we get the word metamorphosis. The idea of coming, becoming a, a butterfly from a chrysalis. You're at one point were a worm, a caterpillar, and now God has given you the opportunity to transform, not by something you do, but by His power. How do you do that? That you would be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the center of our being, not just, not just our headspace, but all of who we are. Renewing your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good and pleasing and perfect will. So we're trying to figure out what God wants us to do. Well, the answer to that is simply live your life in Him. Don't conform to the patterns of the world. Be in the continual process of being transformed. That, by the way, is the language here. It's the idea of don't just be transformed once, but the continuous process of transformation. And then in verse 3, it says, For by grace given me, 
I say to every one of you, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of us. So I'm just going to give you some talking points. Here's one of them. The walk of a Christian is characterized by humility. Have you ever run into a Christian that it seems like they are anything but humble? You run into them and it's like, hey, I know something you don't. I'm going to heaven, you're not. And I want to rub your nose in it. You know, that's horrible. I see people all the time that are more concerned about winning an argument than they are about winning people around them. When Scripture tells you to be salt and light, that's really what he means. It doesn't mean that you run around and beat everybody up with your Bible knowledge. I hope I never am guilty of that. I hope you're never guilty of that. So it's characterized by humility, considering others better than yourself. And in verse 4, it goes on and says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, so these members do not all have the same function. Aren't you glad? So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts. We've got some kidneys. We've got some hearts. We've got some lungs. We've got some brains. We've got some, you know, whatever. We have different gifts according to grace given to each of us. If your spirit is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. And prophesy, by the way, <clears throat> is the idea not of foretelling. Where there's no fortune tellers anymore. It's the idea of teaching forward. Forthtelling, not foretelling. You understand the difference? And there are prophets in the world today that speak the truth and speak hard and, and, and see things very black and white. And you'll run into those occasionally. But it says, if that's your gift, then prophesy according with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. And as I think of these, as I read through these, I think of people within our body that characterize these things. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. Exhorters, as they call it. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So the second point is, we are to function as one coordinated body, not just any body, but the body functioning in Christ. Have you ever seen, uh, some of you probably have watched the Olympic trials recently. Aren't those athletes incredible? You, you, look at, you, you look at a runner and you say, how in the world can a runner run faster than the last generation and yet they do? It just goes on and on and on. Better training, better equipment, better physical, everything. But what's characteristic of those? Every part is functioning properly. And if it didn't, they wouldn't be where they are. And that's what the body of Christ has been called to be and do. When, when we have, you know, a broken arm. Uh, I broke an elbow playing football in high school and didn't know it. And I tried to go into basketball and played basketball, but it was an extremely painful thing every time I would shoot a ball. And then I went into baseball, and all of a sudden... I ended up playing first base because my fastball was probably about 50 miles an hour. It just wasn't there. It wasn't functioning properly. For the body of Christ to work as it's supposed to work, we have to function as one coordinated body. And when one part, here's the key thing for us, when one of our parts gets broken or gets sick or gets out of sorts, it's part of our responsibility to pull alongside to take up some of the slack and also to be there to be a help when we can be and where we can be. I said in number three, I just will state it right out. Love requires action. 
I've often said this about the church. There's no place in Scripture where it says, hey, Christian, guess what? Christianity is a spectator sport. Sit back, take it easy, go on cruise control. It doesn't happen. When you're called to Christ, you're called to certain things. So love requires action. And there's about about 20 of them, I guess, or 13, 14. I don't know how many. I didn't count them all. You can count them as you go through this. But let's look at some of these things that shows love in action. It says, first of all, love must be sincere. That means without wax. It's where we get the word hypocrisy. A hypocrite used to be in, in Greek theater. They would, actors would play male and female parts. And they would wear masks. And scripture says, don't wear the mask. Don't be a hypocrite. That's what it's talking about. Love must be sincere. Do you ever run into Christians that, that um, you know, they come in, you come in on a Sunday morning and they seem to be so loving and warm. And the rest of the week, they're like a grizzly bear. You see them in the job market or out, and, out at work and you go, oh, that's a Christ follower. Thanks, but no thanks. I don't want to be any of that. So we've got to be sincere in our love. Hate what is evil. Culturally, we could use a lot of help in that. But look at the next part. You don't just hate what is evil. Because I see a lot of people walk around and do, what are you doing? I'm hating evil. <laughs> I say, come on. Life is supposed to be full of joy. So here's the next part. Cling to what is good. We used to tell our kids here, or I tell our teachers, don't take something away from the kids without replacing it with something good. We fail miserably at that a lot of times. But one of the things I didn't want in our school, I didn't want our kids to hate the school rules, and because they hated the school rules, they began to hate Jesus. And I see that happen a lot of times in Christian education. We've got to work hard at that. So replace the evil with good. Be devoted to one another in love. I, I love seeing the church be the church, and you guys do a good job with that. I've watched it for, you know, almost 50 years now. I guess it has been 50 years. Of this church being the church and loving on each other. So don't, as we grow, don't lose that. Don't lose that ability. Honor one another above yourselves. Don't get high and mighty. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. You know, I look back over the course of being a Christian a lot of years, and it would be easy to say, now nah, I'm just going on cruise control now. But I always hear Craig Rochelle whispering in the background, you ain't dead, you ain't done. Reminding us that we still have responsibilities. Then it goes on. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction. See, the first part's pretty easy, right? Be joyful in hope. Yoo hoo Patient in affliction. Oh, man. What a challenge. Faithful in prayer. You want help with us being patient in affliction? Here's the answer to it. Be faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. That's not just physical need, even though that includes physical need. I talked to Ruby Pierce yesterday, Carl's wife. She's asking me what she can give the church for the things that we're doing for her and with them for Carl. And I said, not a penny. Get out of here. We need to be thinking of ways to help you, not ways that you can help us. But that's also the personality of Carl and Ruby Pierce. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. And then it goes on. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. As Christ followers today, you're going to run into that opposition. Just bless those who persecute you. 
And then verse 15 is the heart of what I want to talk about today. I just offered it up in our prayer a minute ago. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Easy part, right? Mourn with those who mourn. What does that look like? Well, some translations would say weep with those who weep. What is that? What? We don't do that well, do we? You know, some of you that, that, that come from Hispanic backgrounds, I've done several Hispanic funerals, and, and I'll watch in your culture where there'll just be this incredibly emotional release of weeping and wailing, and whoa, it's, I think, they are never going to recover from this. And the grief is just huge. And then all of a sudden they go, okay, let's eat. And you go, what just happened here? You saw a deep level of grief in a way that we're not used to, but in a way that's probably healthier than some of the ways we try to grieve. Because what do we do? Got to have a stiff off our lip, right? No, you don't. Whoever told you that? You know, the old, uh, remember Tom Hanks in the uh, League of Their Own? Are you crying? Are you crying? There's no crying in baseball. And now, not that I haven't used that line a few times in baseball, but um, where did that come from? Sometimes the very thing that we need to do is just stop and weep. I saw something, I think it was somebody posted on Facebook this week who obviously had been going through a tough time. And it said, when you don't know what to pray, and it simply said, dear God, and it was a blank piece of paper with a bunch of teardrops on it. And then it said, in Jesus' name, amen. And I thought, oh, boy, I've thought that so many times where I couldn't get a word out. All I could do was just say, God, help. And there are times when we'll experience that. So it's the idea of having empathy for those who are grieving. To get to the place where we can sense the sorrow with them in the way that says, I'm here for you. Now, obviously, you can't experience it at that level of intensity. It, that, that, would be, that would just be weird. But we can be there and say, I'm here with you. I'm here for you. Know that you're loved. Know that you're loved by this body. Know that you're loved by the people in this community. And look for ways to ease the load. I think that's what it means when it says mourn with those who mourn. Let me just give you a few things that over the years that, that I found helpful and, and uh, hopefully will, will be a help to you. Uh, sadly, I, I, I often joke with people when it's appropriate to joke, rejoicing with those who rejoice. And I go, yeah, you know, I've probably dumped more bodies in the ocean down here than anybody around. And they go, what? And the answer is, I've spread a lot of ashes over the years. <laughs> and uh, in fact, now what I do is I put in the GPS number. So if you ever get to my GPS numbers and you think you're finding a good lobster spot, you may not be. <laughs> so let me just give you a few things. Number one, and you may want to take a picture of these because I'm going to put them up. But just Number one, don't be impatient for others to finish their grieving process. Have you ever heard somebody say that? I, I know, there's, I, I have two ladies that just came to mind as I said that, who lost brothers, different families, different situations completely, years ago in tra tragic accidents, and they're still grieving the loss of their brother, like it happened yesterday. So don't be impatient. Grieving doesn't end. It may lessen. As I refer to it, you often form scar tissue. It gets moved to a back burner, but it doesn't disappear. It doesn't adhere to a timetable. 
I've said this a million times with people that are grieving. There is no right or wrong way to grieve. And there are stages of grief. You guys, some of you have experienced that on your own, where you've, where you've had denial, uh, sorrow, then anger. I've had, people, I've had people literally, I'm one of them, shake their fist at God, you know, in that anger. And then there's acceptance. Second, there isn't a cure for grief. You don't fix other people's grief. It's not your job. You can't. Number three, acknowledge their pain. It's a key one. Don't tell your grief story. I'm expecting it to somehow deflect their grief. Oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. I lost my brother. Or, oh, I'm so sorry. I lost my dad. Or, I mean, what, 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 is, what does that do? Number four, listen rather than give advice. As guys, we tend to want to fix it. Let me give you the four things to help you with your grief right now. What? Just be there. And that includes not offering up platitudes. Some of the dumbest things I've ever heard said are around people who are experiencing grief. God takes the most beautiful flowers first. It's one of the most hideous things I could ever imagine being said. You know. Oh, well, they lived a good life. They were an old person. It's a good thing God took them to heaven. You know, what? Come on. Don't do that. That's really dismissive of the pain and the grief that the person is feeling. I call it practice the be with principle. Some of you have tell this before, but you remember when in the book of Job, the oldest book in the Bible, by the way, the Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, and Elihu were, were Job's friends. You remember what got them in trouble? What got those guys in trouble? They opened their mouth. They sat with Job for several days and didn't say a word. They were practicing. You remember, what's it called? Somebody that have, I have a Hebrew background, what's that called? It's called Shiva. They were just being with Job. And then they opened their mouth. <laughs> Job, man, you must really be a sinner. What in the world did you do to cause this? This guy's lost his entire family, his entire wealth, everything, including his health. And they're accusing him. That's not being with. So practice the be with principle. I was asked a rotary one time to come up with an extemporaneous. What do you do when people are in grief? How do you help them? I said, show up, shut up, and keep showing up. That was the whole talk. It took about 30 seconds. Number five, last one. Don't talk about learning lessons. So what do you think God has in this for you? God wants you to grieve. He doesn't want you to have a lesson. He wants you to be in the moment. So church, we need to pull alongside each other and celebrate our wins and our joys. But we also need to enter into the sorrows that others may be feeling. You ever stub your toe? Is it just that toe that hurts? No. When you stub a toe or break a toe, your whole body hurts, doesn't it? You ever get a toothache? Does it just that one spot, that one tooth that hurts? No. You think you're going to die because your whole body is feeling that pain. So the entire body is affected. When somebody is suffering loss, the entire body of Christ experiences that. There is no way around 
the body of Christ, losing people they love. We're going to do it. It's going to happen. And we need to pull alongside those that are experiencing it, and it's raw and fresh to them, as in the case of, of Trevor and Nikki and the family right now. I want you to watch this one more little clip because this is from our Daily Bread. By the way, if you guys, if you really want a good tool to do devotionally every day, our Daily Bread is about the best you can do. I start my morning, Colleen can tell you, before I roll out of bed in the morning. I roll over, sit on the edge of bed, and I do our Daily Bread, very first thing. So let's take a look at this clip. One thing that I love about about Jesus is that that he always met each individual person right where they were in scripture. He didn't shy away from hard situations and he didn't let charismatic leaders intimidate him. Whether talking to a puffed up Pharisee or Mary, a grieving woman who just lost her brother, he always dealt with people's hearts and he still does. He does that with you and me. My best friends have seen me cry in hard times. They've also celebrated with me when I've had success in life. But the only way that we really can genuinely participate in another person's joy and sorrow is if we first have that relationship with them. That's what God is calling us into with today's passage in Romans 12. Paul says that we who call ourselves Christians should be weeping with those who weep and rejoicing with those who rejoice. What is he really asking us to do, you guys? Well, he's asking us to be present in other people's messy lives. Like Jesus, we as followers of Christ are not to shy away from the hard, but press into it. And on the flip side, not let envy or our pride keep us from rejoicing with others in their success. We need each other in the good and the bad times. So my challenge for you is to be bold. Whether in your church or your neighborhood or your work, who is someone you see struggling? Struggle with them. And who is someone maybe you didn't want to rejoice with? Ask God to help you rejoice with them. This is what Jesus did and continues to do for you and me. He stays and he rallies with us when it's hard. And he still celebrates with us in our moments of victory. You guys, we get to do this important work with him as we mourn and celebrate with others. This is missional living. We get to carry good news to the world with our lives as we shoulder our neighbor's burden and praise God with them in the good. So I love that phrase, this is missional living. This is just the body of Christ being the body of Christ for each other. So that's what we get to do. So before we finish this passage up, I just I want to uh, share a passage that I believe is the most comforting in all of Scripture and probably one I use at more memorial services than, than any other passage that I use, and it's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. It says, brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep, meaning those who have passed away in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Now, let me ask you, does that say do not grieve? No. There is grief. There's deep grief. It says do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope hope. Part of the joy of being a body of Christ is that we can stand with an incredible hope so that we know that our grief will pass and for eternity we will be with those we love. I was thinking about Carl and his wife Ruby moved out to the Washington, Oregon coast west coast of the United States. I just recently moved back to Florida. But at first, when it didn't hit me, it was because Carl's been gone. And I felt like, okay. And I, so what I had to resolve myself to is, and that's true with family members as well, this is like they moved away for a while. But there's going to, in a short time, and for some of us, a very short time, we are going to be together again, be reunited. And that's the hope 
that we have. You say, well, how do you know that? Look what it says. It says, don't grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. There's our song. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Listen, if you don't get anything else out of this message this morning, understand this. That you don't ever have to hope or doubt or wonder about your own salvation. In 1 John 5, 13, John said, these things I've written unto you, talking about the gospel, these things I've written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you can have eternal life and that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. I've talked to people that, I, that have been in church their entire life and near the end they'll go, well, I sure hope. <laughs> what do you mean you sure hope? You may know that you have eternal life. That nails it for me. That's a convincing verse that would, would make me, if, I, if there was no other passage, I'd go, okay. If I can believe this, if I can believe in the empty tomb, then I have to know that heaven is my home. You may know that you have eternal life. You know what I know? that I know that I know, I know that Donna Mayfield Mann knew the Lord. She knew Christ. I know that I know that, and that's the hope, and that's the hope that Trevor lives with. It's a hope that Nikki lives with. It's a hope that Isla and Lacey and our family live with. It doesn't ease the pain other than the fact that we, okay, it's not permanent. That's the assurance that we have. So let's finish up the passage. We're almost done. It says, live in harmony with one another. It's part of it. Don't be proud. Be willing to associate with people of low position. Don't be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Boy, do we need that right now. Just, I'm talking about culturally. Don't take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you're heaping burning coals of head on his burning coals on his head. Now that's to me was always a weird verse. It's quoting Proverbs 25, 21, and 22. And I, here's here's a I just found this in a commentary. It's I, because I thought I got to go back and figure out what that's about. The coals on the head may refer to a ritual in Egypt in which a person shows his repentance by carrying a pan of burning coals on his head. Helping rather than cursing an enemy may cause him to be ashamed and penitent. No promise, no guarantee, but that's indeed. In other words, your kindness may lead to them being sorry. And then verse 21, it says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There are some local politicians that will tell you, if you say, what advice did Tony give you? They will say, he told me to take the high road. Now, they haven't always done it. <laughs> but see, that's, such, that's advice you can give to anybody. Take the high road. Because when you enter into the evil, into their life, into their world, it just leads to destruction. So going back to the rejoicing with those who rejoice and mourning with those who mourn, which is really the focus this morning. I just want to finish that passage out. But many of us can testify firsthand that when we look back over seasons of intense grief, probably almost anybody in this room could, could t say this. We don't remember the exact words that people shared, but we do remember the people. 
We remember who showed up. We remember who sat with us in our tears. We remember who was there. That's the be with principle. In 1 Corinthians 12, 26, we'll close with this. If any one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Hear that, body of Christ? People all around you are hurting. People in this room hurting. Oh, we can't just shrug it off and say, okay, let's move on. All the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. See, the day will come and we'll celebrate together. But there's also a day when we just need to pause and weep together. Not physically weeping, but certainly as a body of Christ. Just experience and be sensitive and empathetic to those that are hurting. So let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your love for us. I pray this morning that you will just be with people in this room that are hurting right now. I pray that your grace will be experienced and felt by them. Father, there are probably some that are here like I am. I have no indication that my dad knew Christ. And that's a sorrow and a pain that will last my entire life but Lord I pray that for those that are hurting that they will find comfort in you I thank you for your promise that we can know that heaven is home the the greatest thing that we can do is to accept that gift knowing that eternity will be set for us. And that when we leave this earth, we'll be face to face with our Savior. And Father, I know there are probably some hurting people right now, and I just would like to pray for them. I'm not going to do anything that's going to put a spotlight on you in any way, but if you say, you know, Pastor, you're right, I'm hurting, and this message made me think about some hurts and I just uh, please remember me in prayer would you just slide your hand up and put it right down for me just to hold it up so I can see it if you just know you're going through some stuff and yeah I'm hurting a little bit today I still look around the room I see some that I know are so Father we lift them up to you and then Father if there's anyone here who says I have not claimed that verse, 1 John 5, 13, that I may know that I have eternal life. And today I want to receive that gift. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. He paid for my sin. There's no sin left to be paid for. That he rose from the grave to prove the fact that he was who he claimed to be, the Savior of the world. And so today, Father, I'm putting my trust in Christ's sin payment, that and that alone as my hope for heaven. If you said that prayer with me, would you slide your hand up and put it down? I won't call you out, but I just would be honored to see it. Thank you. Thank you. Father, you know the hearts today. You know that this is a time when we should be walking softly with each other. So may we be sensitive and tender to the needs that are around us, to those that are hurting. May we apply these principles from Romans chapter 12 to our lives. And may you use us in a very special way in this community, in this world. I pray now, Father, as we uh, take time to receive this offering, that we will
do so in a way that will be honoring to you and that we will uh, give as we are able. We just pray your blessing over it. Thank you for everyone that's here today. Bless them. Bless this service. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks, everybody.